we pick up part 6 of the Persia Rises series in 424 BCE. The Achaemenid Empire of the Persians is now past its zenith. This great and mighty empire which Cyrus the Great had founded and successors like Cambyses and Darius the Great expanded still for now stretches into three continents. Almost half of the world's population of just over 100 million profess fealty to the kings of kings. The mighty Roman Empire, while claiming 65 million a half millennium later by comparison, only ruled over one-fifth of the world. However, the sands of time are ever-shifting, and the only permanence is that there is no permanence. The greatest of empires will eventually fall, no matter how unlikely that may seem, at the height of their greatness. Artaxerxes I died in 424, leaving his son Xerxes II as the new king of kings of the mighty Achaemenid Empire. However, his ascension was not without contention. Both of his illegitimate brothers, Ochus and Sogdianus, also claimed the throne for themselves. Accounts of this interim period are not only vague, but they vary considerably. One theory is that all three were, for a time, declared rulers and recognized by various regions. Xerxes II recognized in the Persian heartland, Darius in Hyrcania, Media, Babylonia, and Egypt, and Sogdianus in Elam. It is surmised that 45 days into the reign of Xerxes II in the Persian heartland, he was assassinated by his half-brother, Sogdianus. Sogdianus was supposedly the child of Artaxerxes I and Queen Damaspia. After a longer rule, but still short at just over six months, he's said to have been suffocated in ash by his brother Ochus. The reason claimed for ash, it is said, was because he had sworn that his brother would not be killed by the sword, by poison, or by hunger. Now, with the crown going to Ochus III of Artaxerxes' many children, Ochus took the name Darius to become known by historians as Darius II. The Greeks, however, were not as kind with their nickname for him of Darius Nothos, or Darius the Bastard. Prior to his ascension, Darius was satrap of Hyrcania, which was the area of land around the southeast of the Caspian Sea. Darius lacked the autonomy of previous kings and was said to have been dominated by a handful of court eunuchs as well as his mother and wife. His wife, Perisatis, was said to have been both cruel and overly ambitious. Complicating matters, but explaining much of her ambition, was being a half-brother to her husband. So rather than marrying into power, she had already belonged to one of the most powerful families in the empire. As with other kings, Darius faced revolts and rebellions, two early such revolts occurring in his former satrapy of Hyrcania and one in Media. Darius managed to suppress these in fairly short order. However, no sooner were they quelled than the hotbed of revolts, Egypt, revolted yet again. This time in 411, under Amerteus, who was related to a general who assisted Inaros II during the rule of Artaxerxes I. Their revolt took the form of a guerrilla uprising, with the rebels striking the Persians around the Nile Delta only to melt back into the delta after the strike, making them a difficult foe to put down. We know also that during Darius's rule, the Persians managed to reclaim tracts of Ionia. This was initiated when the satraps of Asia Minor, Tisophernes, and Pharnabasus were mandated to collect long overdue tributes. An alliance was formed with Sparta against Athens. One of Darius's last actions saw him appoint his son, Cyrus the Younger, as commander-in-chief of Asia Minor, replacing Tisophernes, the previous commander. He also poured the empire's resources into rebuilding the Spartan fleet, which was critical in the Spartan victory over the Athenians in 405 at the Battle of Egospotome. Darius II, however, would die the following year in 404. Succeeding Darius, was his son, Arsimes, whom he had fathered with his half-sister, Parisatis. Arsimes 
was crowned in Persargadae and took the name Artaxerxes, becoming Artaxerxes II. Just after his father's death, Amorteus of Egypt, who had started his revolt in 411, managed to secure victory over the Persians in Egypt after the seven-year guerrilla campaign. Another common theme of the Achaemenid rulers would impact the newly crowned King of Kings, a brother with a counterclaim to the throne. His half-brother Cyrus the Younger, who had been appointed a satrap of Asia Minor by their father, started his claim and said it was based on being born after their father and his mother took to the throne, whereas he argued Artaxerxes II was born prior to their father sitting on the throne. Artaxerxes had hoped to resolve this peacefully, but negotiations with his half-brother fell through. Cyrus took up arms, backed by an army of mercenary Greeks called the Ten Thousand. With this army, he planned to take the throne. The first major battle would see Cyrus's army win a tactical victory, but at the expense of his own life, rendering it a moot point. It is said that Cyrus fell at the hands of Mithridates, a young Persian soldier who it was said killed Cyrus accidentally, not even realizing what he had done until later in the battle. The story goes that Cyrus, knowing the victory was his, passed through his enemy's lines, yelling, clear the way, villains, clear the way, which many Persians, many even kneeling to him, acknowledging. However, during this, his crown dropped off his head, and Mithridates, running by, struck him in the temple with a dart. Cyrus would bleed out and die within minutes, and Mithridates was treated as a hero by Artaxerxes and given much riches on the condition that he and others maintain that it was Artaxerxes who scored the killing blow. For the same reason men boast of things they have done or wish they had, Mithridates began to boast at the party as he got progressively more drunk, eventually yelling that it was he who scored the killing blow and not Artaxerxes. This turned out to be a fatal mistake, as Artaxerxes would have him executed in a ghastly and macabre way by pinning him between stacked boats with his arms and legs dangling out the sides, his face covered in honey to attract flies, and he would be force-fed. This would of course lead to bodily functions that would go uncleaned, and the same flies that had been feasting on the honey would procreate and lay their eggs in the fecal matter, which eventually saw eggs being laid in his gastrointestinal tract and die. The top boat would then be removed to the squishy sound of fly larvae hungrily devouring what was left of his flesh. All in all, definitely not a kingly way to go. As with his last few predecessors, the King of Kings had learned their lessons well against the Greeks. Rather than engage directly, they would fight via proxies. This proved not only much more effective, it also had the side benefit of sparing Persian lives as the Greeks were left to fight amongst themselves, mostly. To reel Sparta in, they subsidized Sparta's enemies, the Persians providing massive subsidies to the Athenians, Thebans, Corinthians, in the form of tens of thousands of Achaemenid Dariks. The resulting political fallout of this was the Corinthian War, which would last between 396 and 387. In the war's major naval battle at Cnidus in 394, the Achaemenids and their proxy allies managed to destroy the Spartan fleet in its entirety. However, Artaxerxes II would slyly and stealthily reverse course almost immediately after this victory and come to terms with Sparta. He would give them control of the Greek mainland in return for the cities of Ionia and Aeolus on the Anatolian coast. What many history books often overlook is the political master class the Persians delivered with the peace of Antalcidas. All those Greek victories came at a cost to the Greeks. The losses forced the Persians to adapt and adapt they did. The Persians would fight Greece by pitting Greeks against themselves. 
Not only did the Persians assist in initiating the Corinthian War, they spelled out the terms of its peace. Terms that would restore the status quo of Ionia back to the Persians, and with only Greek blood spilled, to write those terms. Artaxerxes next had to deal with an internal threat. The Caducian, an Iranian people who lived in the land to the immediate southwest of the Caspian Sea, were in the process of revolting, having refused the payment of tribute. Artaxerxes personally led the campaign into the Caducian territory, which was extremely mountainous. At first, it appeared to be not so wise a strategy as food for his massive army of what we are told was 300,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry was in short supply. Even if we conservatively assume the actual numbers were much lower, there's no doubt that food was scarce for tens of thousands of people and animals. However, as he had done with the Greeks, Artaxerxes was able to rely on political maneuvers rather than having to spill Persian blood. Thanks to the idea of one of his generals, Tribasus, Tribasus, whose plan was to speak to one of the opposing two Caducian chieftains, while the other general, Datames, did the same. They would each convince their chief that the other was suing for peace with the Achaemenids. The end result was complete capitulation of both and a bending of the knee to the Achaemenids. What would an Achaemenid king's reign be without conflict in Egypt? Artaxerxes attempted to regain control of Egypt and sent Pharnabasus, the satrap of Hellespontine Phrygia. Pharnabasus had proven his mettle against the Spartans and, wishing to repeat his past successes, spent four methodical years in the Levant practicing his military response to Egypt. Historical records state that a force of 200,000 Persian troops was raised along with 300 triremes, 200 galleys, and 12,000 Greek mercenaries under Iphicrates, a Greek general renowned for his contributions to tactical warfare of the period. While these forces were being prepared, Artaxerxes' inner circle had been attempting to convince Athens to summon back one of their generals by the name of Chabrias, who was assisting the Egyptians. However, the Athenians did not comply. The end result is that while the Persians had 12,000 Greek mercenaries, the Egyptians likewise had a Greek mercenary presence. While the Persians had been training for contingencies, they had not factored in the variable of deployment speed. When they landed near Mendes in 373, their forces were too slow, giving the Egyptians the benefit of that critical variable of time. The Egyptians under Pharaoh Nectanebo not only strengthened their defenses, but they flooded areas of the Nile Delta to further slow the Persian advance. The other thing the variable of time allowed for was dissension, and by the time the Persians and their mercenary allies had neared Memphis, there was substantial infighting and disagreement between Pharnabasus and the Greek general Iphicrates. To make matters even more dire, helping the Egyptian flood efforts was nature itself, which served to expand the scope of the flooding to such an extent that the Egyptian morale had gone from one of certain defeat to overwhelming victory, while that of the Persians ebbed with the very flow of the waters around them. Pharnabasus, who was no young man at 70 years of age, called off their plans and headed back to Persia. The Persians were able to contain the Egyptians, however, as they had attempted to invade Phoenicia. By this time, the aging Pharnabasus had been replaced by Datames. Datames then attempted a second expedition to Egypt, but this too failed before gaining the required traction. The failures in Egypt resonated with many of the satrapies in Asia Minor, and they too began to rebel against Artaxerxes in what history recorded as the Great Satraps Revolt. The satrapies of Datames, Ario Barnazes, and Orontes of Armenia directly, and a handful of others indirectly, supported the rebellion. Pharaoh Nectanebo of Egypt backed the rebelling satraps directly with monetary funds, and he re-established ties with both Sparta and Athens. Artaxerxes made this his main focus, 
and by 362 was able to quash the revolt. During the latter years of this revolt, Artaxerxes again tried to mediate in conflicts between the Greek city-states. However, as had been his policies, he ensured that Persia would get the most out of any mediations, so this time he secretly threw his support behind the Thebans who were at war with Sparta. He sent Philicus of Abydos, who was a military commander of the satrap Ariobarzanes, to Delphi, where the negotiations were taking place. However, the Thebans were stubborn, and when asked to return Messenia to the Spartans, they refused. Messenia in the southwest was viewed as being too strategic a location by the Thebans, and of course, an extension of the homeland to the Spartans. Philicus used funds to finance additional troops for the Spartans prior to leaving the peace conference. This allowed Sparta to continue the conflict and resulting war. It's said he may have also offered and provided funds to the Athenians. In the autumn of 367, the Spartans, Athenians, Arcadians, Argives, Elians, and Thebans, along with a handful of other city-states, sent their diplomats to Susa to obtain Achaemenid support in the ongoing conflict. Diplomats that were to ensure the information was forwarded to Artaxerxes in his capital. In what was perhaps a diplomatic misstep, Artaxerxes responded to the city-states with a proposal that was obviously tipped towards the Thebans, which the other city-states wasted no time in rejecting. Sparta and Athens seemingly taking a page from the Achaemenid new playbook for Greek interference made a resolution to support the opponents of the Achaemenids. The Athenians sent a large mercenary force to Egypt under Chabris, one of their generals. Artaxerxes would increasingly spend funds on building projects as he got older. Projects like the restoration of the palace of Darius I at Susa and other projects like defensive fortifications around Ecbatana. One enemy that no empire, emperor, or king has been able to outrun, though, was time, and Artaxerxes would prove no exception. He would die either in his late 70s or 80s, depending on which records you adhere to, having lived a life ranging from harem intrigue and much conflict. His son, Artaxerxes III, would succeed him as the last ruler of any significant length. However, a storm was already brewing in Macedon, a storm that would threaten the very foundation of the Achaemenids and their centuries-old empire.